Hello once more everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and welcome back. We are looking at Revelation 19 now. This will be part one. Now if I sound a bit crook it's because I am slightly, I feel fine but my throat is not clear and if I keep waiting for it to clear up I'm never going to get to doing this so I've decided to press on. Like Revelation chapter 18, chapter 19 and beyond is dealing with uh, events that are holy in the future and so we need to continue to remain cautious in our approach to these things. Anyone who claims to have all these things sorted out and who claims to know the exact sequence of events is being highly presumptuous and mischievous in my personal opinion. My purpose in looking at these closing chapters while proffering an explanation as to their contents I am not wishing to get into a great theological debate about the ins and outs of these things and we may have to agree to disagree on some or many of the points that are here. The things before us are difficult to interpret. In fact, this has been the case since we looked at the period closing with the sixth vial of wrath and coming into the seventh. It is difficult to interpret with any clear certainty, particularly if you wish to really nail things down. I don't think that is quite possible. We look at world affairs. At the moment, it's late 2022 and things are changing and deteriorating rapidly. The prospects of World War III, a nuclear war and a great reset and new world order uh, seem very real and likely, but as to what is really going on behind the scenes and who are the good and the bad guys and how this relates to the prophecy is difficult to interpret and I believe that is because we are right in the center of the action in my opinion, in the center of the fulfillment of the seventh vial of wrath. And its fulfillment will only become clearer as we get closer to the other side. The American broadcast correspondent who came to prominence during World War II, uh, a Mr. Edward R. Morrow said, anyone who isn't confused really doesn't understand the situation. And I think this is probably the best way of looking at things as they stand now. The fact is that time will tell what the full meaning of all these things is and perhaps a better understanding will come to us as the events start to unravel. Bible prophecy is best understood after the events have occurred and that is simply the way that God has purposed it to be understood and so we don't need to understand sorry I'll say that again so we don't need to be overly concerned about some of the details throughout this series we have seen God's active hand in history down through the last 2,000 years we have seen the Lord Jesus Christ move uh, in world affairs not in a general understanding that God is sovereign and in control, which any Christian would probably agree with, but we have seen it with our own eyes as we have followed uh, the historical fulfillment of prophecy in world history. Some of these things, like Trumpets 5 and 6, came with such a high level of prophetic detail, it is simply a great shame that these things are not more widely known and taught. You see, the benefit that comes from a proper understanding of Bible prophecy through its historical fulfillment is that we can point to what God has done in the past with certainty and with equal certainty we can look to the future and know that the God that we have is the same yesterday, today and forever and it is most assuredly all under control. The futurists, the dispensationalists, know next to nothing of these things. They are expecting much trouble ahead and then they have their solution to it and that is to be raptured out of here before they can get into any trouble. Nonetheless, as you read their writings and view their videos and sometimes I field their questions, they remain worried about the coming, their coming great one man antichrist world leader and the mark of the beast 
and they are hoping, really hoping, that they will not be around for any of this. And this is a childish view of Bible prophecy and the nature of the God that we serve and does much harm to a proper understanding of the Word of God and the work of Jesus Christ that he has been doing these last 2,000 years. My friend, Brother Robert Carangola said, quote, True interpretation of prophetic language has established that this conflict was to be long in duration, but of a certain outcome. And this is a very sensible way of summarizing what is set before us in the book of Revelation. The prophecy has covered off almost all of the last 2,000 years, quite a long period of time. The futurists see it only dealing with seven years. They do not see and comprehend the grand nature of the prophecy. It dealt, has dealt with the last 2,000 years and is still dealing with this world even to this present time and beyond. We don't know all of the details about things that are yet to be fulfilled at this point, but the outcome is beyond doubt. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is victorious, as I have shown in the introduction slide to this chapter. Let us all then be encouraged by this even if we are not quite sure of what the next step along the way is. Amen. As for how long this conflict actually has been in play, well, as it relates to the grand prophecy of Daniel 2 and 7, it has exceeded two and a half thousand years at the present time. The diagrams I'm going to show here and the next uh, couple of slides are taken from my Preterism series, so if you're interested in what I am showing here, please go to that series where I unpack this in a great amount of detail. In this diagram, we can see that the prophecy started in 604 BC with the, with the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar, and this has proceeded through the empires of the Medo-Persians and the Greeks, down to pagan Rome, which became Papal Rome, and with the loss of papal temporal power in the 19th century, this has brought it to its final stage as the great city divided into three parts, and instead of ten European kingdoms as of old, it is now a European republic known to us as the EU. We do know for certainty that the prophecy started in 604 BC because of how this relates to Ptolemy's Canon of Kings and the record of the Babylonian succession of kings is shown here. I'm going to leave it up to you to go to the Preterism series that I have on my YouTube channel to get a full understanding of how this secular record dovetails in with the Grand Prophecy. The Fourth World Empire captures most of the attention of the Grand Prophecy, and it is this that the Book of Revelation essentially deals with. The Roman Kingdom starts off as a kingdom of iron, and then it transitions to feet of iron mixed with clay, and it is in fact this form that it becomes its most dangerous as far as the kingdoms of men go. But God is on the throne, praise the Lord. And this period also coincides with the New Testament, starting with the birth of Jesus Christ. This era is the era of the Gospel, the New Testament, in which the Gospel of the Kingdom of God is preached. So we see that this era contains both the worst of, of man, of earth, of Satan, of the kingdoms of men, and and the angels of Satan, but at the very same time, it contains the best of heaven and of our Lord Jesus Christ and the coming forth of his glorious gospel and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and many other gifts that Jesus Christ has given unto us. This era is the subject of the book of Revelation. This book contains the prophecy of the seven seals, the seven trumpets and seven vials, a trifold series of 21 visions plus a few others, and it prophesies the history of the iron and also the iron and clay kingdoms and reveals to us the ultimate triumph of the stone kingdom of Jesus Christ over all the kingdoms of men. Praise ye the Lord. The fourth 
empire opened with the first coming of Jesus Christ and it will end ultimately with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Once more, I invite you to go to my Preterism series where I more fully unpack the statement that I've just made that the Fourth World Empire opens with the birth of Jesus Christ. To be more precise, it opens with Augustus, who was the Roman emperor at the time of Jesus Christ, his birth, and it will end with the coming again of Jesus Christ and the full manifestation of his kingdom on earth. We are not going anywhere. Everything is going to get sorted out and put in its proper place right here on earth. And God willing, if you and I should live long enough, we will see this with our very eyes. Praise ye the Lord. The entire edifice of the kingdoms of men as given to us in Daniel chapter 2 is very revealing. The most valuable and also the heaviest metals are on top. And as we proceed down through the kingdoms of men, we are brought to the fourth world empire, the worst of them all, but at the same time, the most worthless of them all. Iron mixed with clay. Who would pay much for that? Furthermore, we can clearly behold that the whole edifice, which is top heavy, is also set upon brittle feet of iron mixed with clay. So while the Fourth World Empire is extremely ferocious and dangerous, it has the st and it brings with it the strength of iron, at the very same time, it is held in place by the most weakest of foundations. At any moment, the whole thing could come crashing down, and in fact, it is going to come crashing down very fast as we saw back in Revelation chapter 18, in one day and in one hour. Given that this last of the world empires is so inherently weak and fragile, it must attack and keep on attacking. After all, there's iron in it, and iron is very strong, much stronger than the gold, the uh, breast and arms of silver and the thighs of brass. It must attack and keep on attacking truth because truth is its biggest threat. And by the way, as Christians, we should be among the loudest voices speaking the truth. However, as we know, many professing believers and professing churches are part of the problem. They are part of this fourth world empire. And unless they come out of her, they will definitely go down with her. Daniel 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. And we looked at all the trial and tremendous tribulation of the saints down through the last 2,000 years. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. They won't know the writing is on the wall. They won't know that it's about to collapse. But the wise shall understand. Now, if you are like uh, myself, you are very saddened very saddened about the condition of our Western nations. The people of this earth that have been given the lively oracles of God, that have been the disseminators of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the four corners of the world. But now we are definitely a seed, a generation of evildoers. We are ruled over by people that hate us. Moral degeneracy is the norm and is applauded while Christianity and traditional values, which all come down to us through the Holy Scriptures, through our God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, are shunned and held in disdain. But this is the way that it would be near unto the end. So let's not forget about that and let us not lose heart. Amen. When your traditional national enemy becomes more upright than your own nation, it's just one more clear sign that your own nation is fast coming to its end and this is the way it is right now. On the 30th of September this year, only just recently, the Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a public address which was very interesting and compelling. It was basically a lawyer's brief for the prosecution against the United States of America and the West. 
In this speech, Putin referred to the United States as neo-colonialists, stating that they only care about their own interests. And by the way, I will add that it was Henry Kissinger that said, America has no permanent friends or enemies, only interests. Putin went on to refer to a lot of history, a strange thing for a lot of us Westerners now to think about history because we don't get taught proper history as they do over in Russia. Putin didn't say that they would use nuclear weapons despite what many media outlets are saying, but what he did say was that the United States is the only nation that has used nuclear weapons twice and they created a precedent. He spoke about the fire bombings of the German cities of Dresden, Hamburg and Cologne and how that this was not militarily necessary, implying that all these things were war crimes, although he did not use those words. He talked of Korea and Vietnam with their carpet bombings and the use of napalm and chemical weapons. Here I have part of the speech in which he says the following. Let's answer some very simple questions for ourselves. Do we want to have here in our country, in Russia, parent number one, parent number two, and parent number three? They have completely lost it. Instead of mother and father, do we want our schools to impose on our children from their earliest days in school perversions that lead to degradation and extinction? Do we want to drum into their heads the ideas that certain other genders exist along with women and men and to offer them gender reassignment surgery? Is this what we want for our country and our children? This is all unacceptable to us. We have a different future of our own. Let me repeat that the dictatorship of the Western elites targets all societies, including the citizens of Western countries themselves. This is a challenge to all. This complete renunciation of what it means to be human, the overthrow of faith and traditional values, and the suppression of freedom are coming to resemble a, quote, religion in reverse, end quote, pure Satanism. Exposing false messiahs, Jesus Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, quote, by their fruits ye shall know them, end quote. These poisonous fruits are already obvious to people, and not only in our country, but also in all countries, including many people in the West itself. It's very sad uh, for me to think about this. The Russian bear being provoked by the United States and NATO into a nuclear war and Putin's speech seems to me strangely like the writing on the wall on the night that Babylon fell. Today Babylon is mystery Babylon and it's coming to an end and it is embedded in our western nations and it's going to come crashing down. Fearful and wonderful things await us, praise the Lord. I do also wish to make it clear that in as much as Putin's speech is very interesting and is applicable and is correct on many fronts, I'm personally not quite sure of what side of the fence he is on. I've said this before that our hope must be in Jesus Christ because we will surely be disappointed if we trust in any man. Many are saying, believing or hoping that Russia is going to save us from the cabal, from the deep state, from the World Economic Forum, their great reset and the new world order. And if you are in this camp, then I encourage you to be very careful as you may end up being greatly disappointed. We all want things to be a simple matter of the good guys versus the bad guys. However, this is not a fictional movie movie we are dealing with here this is real life while God may well be using Russia and the East to sorely punish the West to bring them down we're not really sure if this is in fact the case Russia may be part of the vehicle being used to bring in the so-called New World Order 
things may continue on for a long while yet with diminishing oil and gas supplies and they are not diminishing because they are running out they are diminishing because of what the West is doing to its own people the West is deliberately our governments the powers that be are deliberately creating the situation to cut supplies of these vital resources we are also going to have to live with skyrocketing inflation and also growing food scarcity. These are very real concerns and they are before us now. All these things are playing into the hands of the ruling elite. The city divided into three parts, as the prophecy says in Revelation 16, and no one really knows how all of this is going to play out. But what we do know for certain is that the kingdom of Christ is victorious and we Christians have to place our hope and confidence in Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus is coming, his kingdom will utterly prevail and he will destroy the kingdoms of men. This is what we know. Amen. In the meantime, as Pastor George Southwick said, we are living between two victories the victory that christ won at calvary and the victory that is yet to be made fully manifest with his kingdom on this earth and this is a comforting thought revelation 19 verse 1 and after these things i heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying hallelujah salvation and glory and honor and power unto the lord our god the phrase and after these things is clearly looking back to the destruction of mystery babylon who is represented by a woman and this has been dealt with in chapter 18. the phrase in heaven should not be understood as a physical location away up far beyond the clouds somewhere but rather, these are the people of God who have been lifted up into heavenly places, as it is declared to be true in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, and Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. The people of God are still on this earth, but they have been lifted up into heavenly places, into places of power and authority, and it is these people, possibly it's going to be you and I, the saved who are alive at this time who are saying alleluia and praise to God and then importantly note that this is the first hallelujah or alleluia recorded in the New Testament and it comes in response to the violent sudden destruction of mystery Babylon this comes as God's judgment is poured out upon this wicked system as seen in chapter 18, and this is simply wonderful. Verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up for ever and ever. This company of the redeemed is rejoicing over the downfall of this terrible Babylonian system that has held sway down through the centuries, that has corrupted the earth, and that has continuously slain and murdered and butchered the servants of the Lord and other people besides. The destruction of mystery Babylon is directly attributed to the Lord our God. It says, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. You see, when God moves, his work is unmistakable and thorough. When we move, it is often out of God's will and time, and so the result is normally unsatisfactory. When Moses was stirred up, he slew a single Egyptian and for fear had to hide him in the sand. But when God moved, he slew all the firstborn males in the land of Egypt and then decimated the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. The result was that God alone was glorif glorified and so it will be again. There will be no wondering about this. Is this the moving of God? Is this the work of God? It will be plain for all to see very exciting 
In verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. In verse 1, we had the first Alleluia in the book of Revelation and indeed in the New Testament. In verse 2, we have the second, and now in verse 4, the third Alleluia. And it underscores the greatness of what has occurred. This is going to change the course of everything. We are talking about great and terrible things coming upon the earth. More specifically, great and terrible things coming upon the wicked. And, and in Hebrews 12, verse 27, we read, And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. In 70 AD, God destroyed that terrible Jewish anti-Christian system that continued in its rejection of Jesus and the New Covenant. The end of Jewry back then was violent in the extreme. Today, it is the Fourth World Empire it is the continuation of the false Roman Catholic system with her agents and Jesuits throughout the world. It is in its ecclesiastical, economic and military forms in this world as we have previously seen. And it's all standing on brittle feet of iron and clay and it's going to fall violently and quickly. And when this occurs, you and I should be looking forward to this for the saints will be shouting out, Alleluia! Praise unto the Lord. Wonderful. This is the end of Revelation 19, part 1.